Humans have had a close relationship with animals for thousands of years. Scientists agree the domestic dog has been a trusted pet for around 15,000 years. And cats became part of the household from 10,000 years ago. And now it's estimated there are at least 600 million pet cats in the world. Exotic pets have also been kept for thousands of years. It's well documented that the Egyptians kept baboons as pets and exotic animals kept in the home feature in many ancient texts. In modern times, the keeping of exotic pets has increased. A staggering statistic is that there are more tigers in the U.S. alone than there are in the wild. Animal owners truly believe they are playing a role in preserving the numbers of exotic animals. But on the other side of the debate, there are those who believe it is a cruel practice to keep any animals in captivity. This series explores the issues from both sides, from those who know the dangers, but see the benefits, to others who condemn the keeping of exotic pets. Their stories follow. From the outside, it looks like an average family home, but this home has some unusual residents. These are our two baby sloths. They're zoo animals, and they're going to go into exhibits in the zoo. But chances are, since my wife raised them, they're probably going to have to come home every night now because they're a little more than just a zoo animal. In 1994, Charlie Samet bought 51 acres of land in Salinas, California. It started as a small exotic animal rental business, supplying animals for film and television with part of the property dedicated to an elephant sanctuary. It grew into Monterey Zoo, which is now home to more than 100 exotic zoo animals. Or maybe Charlie and his wife, Lisa, just have a lot of peculiar pets. We treat them, I guess, by definition, like pets. It's tough to say I don't think people should have them as pets because we spend 24 hours a day with them. Because we're a zoo, we're able to do that. If we had to go to work every day and spend what little time we had left with them, I don't know that they could get the care they need to stay healthy. And they're so fragile. They can't walk on the ground. They have to hold you. They've got a cute little seal-like face, and you put all that together, and people just adore them. They're needy. Uh, but although they're a little more aggressive than some might think. While the sloths are young, Charlie's schedule revolves completely around their care. So, what's funny is, your, your life revolves around them. If we're out somewhere, we have to get home because Bugsy and Belle have to get their exercise. Lisa lets them runs around the house at night. Um, and then we have to make their food and it has to be cut a certain way. Oh, baby. I know. Hmm. Now, how do you do this and convince somebody that it doesn't make a good pet? I get it. But I mean, yeah, look at that face. He's real bitey. Sometimes he just gets in these moods, and Lisa will take him into the dining room. They like, at the bottom of our dining room chairs is their jungle gym. They chase each other all over. And uh, we'll go walking by, and they'll just come crawling across the floor, lunging at us. It's like, I, don't, I think they're playing war. But yeah, when he's in a bad mood, he can be very mighty. Monterey Zoo is not an accredited zoo, and that's what allows them to treat their animals more like pets than zoo exhibits. We've chosen not to be accredited by the larger institutions, the larger clubs, if you will, because some of the rules they have prohibit us from giving the elephants the quality of life they need. I think we treat them like pets, but I think we treat the elephants like pets too, and I can't bring them home. Now, my home is on the zoo property. Is that what makes the difference? I, I don't know. 
Uh, some of my staff don't have homes on the zoo property and I let them take some things home. Are they pets? How do you define it? They come right back to the zoo and they have a purpose at the zoo, but we try to treat them all like pets. And the sloths aren't Charlie's most unusual zoo exhibit pets. Wife Lisa has forged a bond with a badger. It was raised here in the house with us. Had its personality and its temperament afforded it to do so, it would still be in the house with us. We love it to death. Unfortunately, it started plucking the tiles off the kitchen floor. So it was time to go to the zoo. But that was a decision it made. It just ended up that way. But we still go down there and put a leash on him and take him for his walk every day like you would a pet. Given that Charlie's career working with animals started with his pet lion, Joseph, it's not surprising that Charlie blurs the line between zoo animals and pets. I had an African lion that was just uh, beyond the scope of reason. He was so safe, so patient, so unusual. My children could ride on his back. Yeah, he did things I wouldn't think of doing today. I can't imagine what I was thinking back then. Uh, but he could come home with me and sleep on the dining room floor. I mean, he was very, very special. A one in a million. It was only because of Joseph's extraordinary nature and willingness to perform that Charlie entered the entertainment industry and later started a zoo. He started this with me. So, I mean, was he a pet? It was much more of a relationship than a, some lion in a zoo with a keeper. I mean, we went to Africa together, we went to Germany together, we went to Mexico together, we've been in every state in the United States. But technically, we were a business. We were in the animal training and animal rental business for entertainment. Now, again, because I was in that business, I was with him the entire time, and so it created that kind of animal. So I will argue that if you're keeping them as a pet, but your business, your industry, isn't something that affords you the time to spend with them, there is no way to keep it safe. You have to stay with them, you have to be with them, you have to have a team of people that are helping you do it. Uh, you, it has to be a professional situation. But that's not to say there's not pet owners that don't work somewhere else. They don't work commercially, but they're with their animals 24 seven, that's what they do. They have the ability to do so, and therefore end up with good animals. Most of the professionals in this business will tell you that some of the best animals they've ever gotten were pets that were confiscated from people because they got so much time and so much interaction that they were just wonderful animals. We have our, um, our regular pets, if you will, okay? Because I do tell people it's nice to come home and sit down on the couch with something that you know probably won't eat you. I know, I know, I know. This chicken was brought into a Los Angeles veterinarian to be euthanized because when it was born, its beak was like this. And the, the veterinary facility, the owner of the facility is a very good friend of mine. And she pointed out that day when I was visiting that if this chicken were a lion or a tiger, we wouldn't think about twice about doing surgeries and fixing it. But because it was a chicken, it's here to be euthanized. So long story short is she told me that she would fix the beak if I would adopt it for the zoo afterwards. And so, um, three surgeries later, with pins and bone marrow transplants, and um, we fixed the chicken. And that's about as good as we got it. But it can eat now, before it had to have a stomach tube, and it can drink. So this is, again, you know, we, we try to tell people, there are unique pets that aren't necessarily lions and tigers. Uh, this happens to be a chicken. The chicken had the Monterey Zoo board divided. It came with controversy. You know, there was a lot of people on our board that said people don't come to zoos and pay to see chickens. 
you know, and our argument was it, it, that's not what it's about. Are we doing what we do because of what people want or are we doing what we do because of what animals need? Never met. Who have Charlie continues outline. to blur the line in their relationship and zoo animal. Even the apex predators get treated like part of the family. You guys okay? Yeah. Put the line up and lock us up. Once again, we're struck by the rapport Charlie has with even the most dangerous animals. These bears may be young, but their claws and teeth could easily kill. Yet with Charlie, the experience feels completely safe. Over the years, Charlie has also worked with many big cats. and they all require a different approach. He credits leopards as being among the most dangerous. The problem with leopards is that you walk in with them and you're in trouble and you didn't know it. A lion or a tiger, they'll be on top of whatever they're possessive of, so you know it. It's a very explosive brain. It's a very different brain. Lions then have your social structure to deal with, so they've learned to fight each other. Many companies won't touch lions. Um, you can have the best lion cub in the world and he turns five, six years old and he tries, to, he challenges you for that position in the pride and it's all gone. I'd say tigers are about the easiest, believe it or not. Unfortunately, their teeth are the longest, so the bites are bad. But the way their brains work, their social structures, they're solitary. That's why in circuses you see more tigers in the ring than anything. Although the entertainment business enabled Charlie to be closer to wild animals than most people will ever get the chance to be, there are some things he doesn't miss about working with animal entertainers, like wrestling lions. That I'll never do again with a lion. Because mm -hmm. that goes from play to sport one day. And when it goes to sport, okay, you have an animal you've never met before right. on top of you. And it's a bad, bad day. So we were prepping for a movie once, for uh, one of Costner's movies, and it was an attack scene. And I did days of this lion coming up on top of me. And one day it turned to sport and I didn't see it. And he hunkered down on me and he bit me. He, he grabbed me right here. I ended up with two broken ribs and a punctured lung. Two people came at him with a CO2. He jumped on one, bit a hole through the CO2, a steel canister. And before I could get up and get away, he was on top of me again and he bit me again. So she had to go get a tractor and drive it over top of me to get the cat off of me. 20 minutes later, and we had him all in a fenced area. We were prepping, okay? Came back, his head seemed right again, opened the door, they got a leash on him and walked him to his cage. He was fine. They're, they're just, they, they are what they are and you know it going into it. Even those who have had extraordinary relationships with exotic animals know there's always an element of danger. I was with Ron Whitfield, a very prominent trainer here, and, and he used to be a circus man, and he worked for Six Flags at the time. You know, I was doing the TV series Born Free, and I needed two lions to simulate a lion fight in the movie. So of course, what we look for is two male lions that were raised together that play. And we'll dub in the noises later and make it sound like it's a fight. Well, I went to see his two lions in his ring act, and um, he brought them into the ring together and they were bouncing around playing with each other. But the play turned to sport and they got in a fight. And when the time it was done and it was over and he separated them, um, I think he's quite frankly, he's the bravest man I've ever seen in my life stay in that ring. I'd never seen anything like it. He did not leave that ring, and the noise, the cement was shaking. Oh, and I was standing outside the ring. You know, Ron, do you need any help? Nope, got it covered. Good. It was terrifying. But despite the danger, Charlie is still inclined to treat even the zoo's most predatory animals as pets. 
When I got him, when we started raising him, <laughs> we did like everything else. Hey, stop it. We did like everything else, and we tried to raise him as a pet. You know, we wanted him to have as much relationship as he possibly could. Um, <laughs> and it just didn't work out. Hey, what are you doing? Well, it's a difficult species. And his hair grows backwards. You don't know if they're a male or a female unless you truly blood test them. Nothing makes sense. They run as fast backwards as they do forwards. Their legs are longer in the front than they are in the back. They're born with teeth. They're born with their eyes open. Nothing is right um, by animal standards. To keep one friendly is a challenge, but it doesn't mean we didn't give it a chance. What's wrong? Why are you so angry today? Hmm? Why are you so angry? In the hyena's case, even Charlie admits that this is one predator that doesn't make a good pet. If you ask me how I feel if one of my neighbors were to come home one day and announce that they got a hyena as a pet, probably wouldn't be real fond of the idea. No two ways about it. I wouldn't want that next door. Charlie even has animals a lot of us have never heard of. This is a binturong, a bear cat. His name is Doc. Doc kind of has his own fan club. People who come get to play with him on one of our tours. They start Facebooking him. It's gotten ridiculous. He's just one of the coolest animals. Are you dangerous? Hmm? Are you dangerous? I know. You're so grumpy. You're so grumpy. Hmm? Yeah. For some reason, Doc has been really nice. Um, he gets to visit with guests, he gets to play with them. Again, raised in the kitchen, you know, in a home, whether it was my home or sometimes he stayed in other people's homes and um, it created this. So if you go to any zoo and you ask for the animal that smells like buttered popcorn, they're gonna take you to a bear cat. Kisses. What? At Charlie's Zoo, even mountain lions, the largest cats in North America, become little more than house cats. She started off in our kitchen before the chicken. With the big cats, as soon as they're able to jump up on the counters, they become part on the house. When it comes to keeping exotic animals as pets, Charlie repeatedly recommends spending large amounts of time with the animals and the need to be a very dedicated pet owner. Training needs to start when the animals are young. Problems with your lions and tigers are, you kinda gotta be here when they're babies and you gotta stick with them when they're babies. You gotta pour a lot into them then if you're gonna have any kind of relationship when they're adults. So there is no safe way to introduce an adult lion or a tiger to someone new without risking that challenge and a train crash as a result of it. So it's, it's far more ideal to have them there when they're babies. Can it work out? Sure. Um, is it supposed to? Probably not. Because there's really no reason why that tiger shouldn't challenge you for that position. You know, anytime you work with a wild or an exotic animal, you're asking it to surrender instinct. The question is, how much instinct is it fair to ask an animal to surrender? That's the question. So even when we were working with circuses, we would suggest to them that it's the relationship between the tiger and the trainer that people are most fascinated with. Is jumping through the fiery hoop really necessary anymore? Because if you're up in the crowd and you listen to the crowd, okay, it's when the trainer walks up and hugs that lion and disappears in his mane, you hear all the oohs and the ahs. 
Entertaining moviegoers or zoo visitors, Charlie has no problem asking his animals to contribute to the running of the household. I don't feel bad for anything I ask my animals to do because I'm really not asking them to do anything I'm not doing also. You know, they have to stand there and take a picture with somebody to help us make ends meet. So do I. And it pays for our home and our food. And that's how the whole thing works. And we all participate, animals included. And I realize there are activists who would argue otherwise. The animals don't have a choice. And I would argue, I'm not sure I do. And you do, you have to sleep at night. So how much instinct is it fair to ask them to surrender? Maybe as I get older, I'm surrendering more and more, you know? But when you have human kids, you find yourself doing that too. Once the zoo is closed for the day and all the visitors have gone, the staff begin the nighttime routine. For Charlie, that means quality time with the exhibits. Right now, everything goes to bed and I usually interrupt it along the way and play with it and the staff hates it because half of them want to go home, and, but it's too bad. And once you've raised chickens, sloths, and badgers in your kitchen and realized your dream of opening a zoo, forming close bonds with all sorts of weird and wild animals, what do you do next? It's kind of a retirement for me. It's uh, open the gate in the morning, close the gate at night, and know that the animals got what I promised. You know, this was all about a promise to Joseph. Unfortunately, he didn't live long enough to see it, but we did promise him that day that we would finish it. That's all this is, one big promise. And, uh, and, it's, and it, I actually now feel like it's gonna happen.